morning, church. It's Braden and Alyssa Miller here. We uh, we attend Monmouth, and we miss you guys. We're just saying hello and checking in, seeing how you're doing. Welcome to online. It's yeah. been kind of a crazy format, but really, really fun. We can't wait to be back together uh, as a body in person, but uh, in the meantime, enjoy the online church. Morning, praise. Morning, people who are serving God. We've got a great big God. I love it. Join me in serving him. See you soon. Good morning, praise. My name is Joyce, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody soon. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. Hello, praise family. I'm Terry Sears from the Kindle Praise. I'm looking forward to being around you again. Welcome, Praise Assembly. Please join us with worship today. Welcome back to Praise Online. It's good to have you in church again. Even though we're separated, we're still together. And it's really important just to check in in this weekly, in this weekly account of what church and what God is saying to us. Before we start and before we get any further, I would like to just pause, though, and just call our church family to prayer. Uh, George Floyd is uh, the man who was killed in, in uh Minnesota, and I, I just, I know the whole place is torn up, and there's so many people hurting over this, and there's so many people uh, hurting and misunderstanding each other. It is so opposite of what the kingdom of God is. And so can I just ask our church family 
to pray today. Uh, pray for our nation, pray for the people who are hurting, and pray that we would be able to share somehow to have empathy for the people who are suffering today. Would you do that with me and just open in prayer for today's service? So Jesus, thank you that your kingdom is what we're really all about and we wanna follow you in every way. Help us, Lord, in, in this time as a nation. We just pause and we reflect on you as being the source of healing, the source of uh, solving the hatred and the, and the divisions that so often rip people apart. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would cause the church to rise up into such a place of wholeness and help and that we would be people of healing and people of empathy. And we just ask that, Lord, and we, we pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, thank you for praying with me. And the rest of this service, we want you to just sit back and enjoy because God has something to say to each of us about the kingdom of God and about the prodigal son and that whole great story that Jesus told. So next we have Ben and Jessica, our children's pastors, with Ruff Ruff, the famous dog. Hey, boys and girls, I'm Jessica, and this is my friend Ruff Ruff, the talking boys dog. Oh. I'm, so, I'm so excited to learn about the parable of the lost bone. Um, it's called the parable of the lost boy, or also called the prodigal son. Oh, I'm sorry. I just am having a hard time focusing ever since I lost my bone. It's all I can think about. <laughs> well, think, Ruff Ruff, where did you last see it? All I can remember is that I put it somewhere real safe and that it would be too uncomfortable to sleep with that <laughs> Well, let me take a look. Well, Ruff Ruff, I would be uncomfortable too because the bone is under your dog bed. <gasps> Jessica, you are a smarty McFarty! Um, oh. thanks, I guess. The dog bone is found. The dog bone is found. I once had a frown, but now I don't. Why? Cause the dog bone is found. Sure is exciting when something that's lost is back where it's supposed to be. Uh, actually, that's what Jesus' parable is about today. What? Jesus taught a parable about losing a bone? Um, not a lost bone, but he shared three parables about things that were lost. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Wow. Today we're going to be learning about the parable of the lost son. Okay, I am ready to learn about the parable. Uh, the parable goes like this. A son told his wealthy father to give him all of his inheritance now before his father died. So the father gave him gave the son his portion of his inheritance early. A, a few days later, this son packed up all of his things and moved far away and wasted all of his money on wild living. Not only was that really mean to ask for his father's <laughs> inheritance that early, but when he wasted that money, Shame on him. Yes, then he had no money left to eat. So he got a very low paying job working for a farmer and he became so hungry that even the pig food looked good to him. Yuck, even I don't like pig food. So the young man decided to go back to his father because he thought my dad just might hire me and I can make more money than I'm making here. So the son began to travel back home. And when the father saw his son from far away returning home, the father ran to his son and said, what are you doing here? You know how much money you wasted, how long you disappeared. You should be ashamed of yourself. No, this father ran to his son and gave him a big hug and kiss and he turned his, to his hired workers and said, bring my son the finest clothes and kill the fattest cow. We are going to celebrate with a feast because my son is home. Wow, who is the father in this story? The father is God our father and the son represents us. You mean if I was to turn away from God, he just wants me to come back to him? That's right, Ruff Ruff. God is way more excited when we come back to him than you are finding your lost bone. Wow, what a great father we have in God. That's right. Boys and girls, why don't you draw us a picture of a son coming back to his father and how happy he must have been. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I can't wait to see those pictures. <laughs> Make sure you have your good listening ears on and enjoy the sermon. Thank you, Jessica and Ruff Ruff. Uh, kids, if you have a piece of paper and something to draw with handy,
Go ahead and set that up and make your pictures during this time and listen in if you can. So uh, we are continuing and actually wrapping up a series on the kingdom of heaven. This has been a kind of a roller coaster journey these last several months for all of us in many ways. And learning about the kingdom of heaven has been, uh, it's, it's something very counterintuitive, countercultural in many ways. Uh, I've heard it said that the kingdom of, of heaven is an upside down kingdom. So we've learned that our heart needs to be in the right place to be in, in God's kingdom. We've learned that the, um, the kingdom is open to everyone and it's not in our control of who is in and who's out. That's something that God does in the end. Uh, that We talked about the net last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, about how God is drawing in people from, from all nations, uh, all people groups to himself. And uh, our job is just to be happy and joyful in the net. Uh, we, Pastor Joe also talked last week about the parable of the Good Samaritan and the idea of empathy, really understanding what someone is going through and showing mercy to them in their time of need. So this week, we're going to be continuing on in uh, Luke chapter 15. And this whole chapter starts when Jesus enters the scene. And connecting with last week with the Good Samaritan and, and how when we show mercy, God shows up. Uh, Jesus entered the scene and it says in Luke chapter 15 verse 2, Look, this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. That was an accusation that the Pharisees and the religious teachers of the time brought to Jesus. They were looking down on him and questioning why he was eating with people that they called sinners, people who didn't match up or measure up to the standards that they thought they should. But that was the context for three stories that really culminate in the story of the prodigal son. Jesus talks about the lost sheep and the shepherd who goes out for the one and brings that sheep back and the celebration and the joy that happens uh, in that moment. He also talks about a lost coin. And when that coin is found, the joy that, that comes in that moment as well. And so we're going to read uh, in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, as uh, this story kind of unfolds for us. So would you just read along with me? Jesus says, to illustrate this point further, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding to the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Now, when we hear about uh, this story, when we think about this, it's often titled the prodigal son. And I looked up the word prodigal because it's not really in our vocabulary today. And it, it really just means a person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. And I want to put it out to you that this story today that we're talking about is not so much about a prodigal son as it is about a prodigal father. And we're going to see this unfold as we continue on, that the father is recklessly extravagant in his generosity, in his acceptance of his son, and as we just read, the, the son was preparing to go home. And so we're going to see in a moment what the father's response to that is. This is not really as much about the son as it is about the father. It's about joy in a restored relationship. 
Now I have a little prop with me, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera from home, but uh, this is a class ring. I'm gonna put it on my finger, but this ring represents a, a story that's really important to me and, and my relationship with my wife, Holly. We were, had just started dating in college, and um, I thought it was a really cool move to offer her my class ring as kind of an uh, incentive, not an incentive, but a, a representation of our, of our uh, dating relationship. So I took a ring, and, and I, we were walking on the Western Oregon University campus one evening. Now, this is the middle of winter, so she had gloves on her hand. And it was a good thing because my fingers are a little bit bigger than hers. So she had her glove on, she stuck the ring over her glove, and we just kept walking around campus. Well, as you probably can put together by the context of what we're talking about, lost things, uh, the ring, unbeknownst to her, fell off of her hand. Uh, if you've ever been to Western Oregon, and especially at night, um, it's kind of hard to find things if you lose them. It's a very big campus. There are a lot of paths. So our first thought was when she finally realized that she had lost the ring, was we ran back to her dormitory. We got a flashlight and we retraced our steps. We found every sidewalk that we had thought we walked on and we went back for a couple of hours. We couldn't find it. That put me in a really strange spot because I wasn't the richest college student and that ring wasn't the cheapest thing. And we were just fairly new in our relationship and I was struggling inside. What am I going to do? Um, should I you know, have her write me a check for the costs? You know, how, what, what, what is my response here? The prodigal son in this story, as it unfolds, he literally cashed out his relationship with his dad. That was something that maybe this unfolded over a, a period of time. It comes pretty quickly as we read it in Luke 15. But he, he requests his inheritance earlier in life. Now, this is kind of a strange thing. You know, inheritance usually comes after someone passes away. Then those, those resources are passed down to the next generation. But this son comes to his father and he says, I want my inheritance now. Essentially, what he was communicating with his dad was that our relationship is over. This is the end of this family connection. I want to go do my own thing. I want to use the, the resources and the, the wealth that you have accumulated. I want to use those for my benefit, not for our family's benefit. We're done. He was ready to move on. And it goes into how he moved on. Wild living is how scripture describes that. And he gets to the place where he squandered all of that. And he's ready to come back home. He realizes that what he has back home is, is better than these pea pods that he might get to enjoy with the pigs. And so the story continues on in, in, in verse 20. And we're just going to read verses 20 to 24. And it says, So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He was basically rehashing this speech that he had already prepared in advance. Now, this is the interesting part because his father doesn't let him finish his speech. He doesn't let him to request to be a servant, because that's all that the son was hoping to become, was just one of the hired hands in his dad's farm. But in verse 22, it says, But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead, and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. 
Extravagant waste was met with extravagant generosity. The son had squandered all of this wealth, this inheritance that he had received, but the father met him, and actually it says he didn't just wait for him to come, he ran to his son and embraced him and welcomed him back into the family. Extravagant waste was met with extravagant generosity. The maximum of the son, the son's hope was to just become a servant, just to be part of the household in some way. But the father had a different thing in mind. The father extended full sonship to him. Now, do you, do you struggle with accepting the fact that you're wrong? Uh, the son had to get to that place. And, and in the story as it unfolds, he even rehearsed his lines before he went back to the father. He was nervous and anxious for that meeting. Um, if you're like me, it's hard to admit when you're wrong. Uh, I, I was a philosophy major in college, so I like to argue, and I like to make a good point, and I like to be right. And that's not always the healthiest thing for a relationship. My wife can tell you about that. So I think over the years, I've grown a little bit in, in how I approach situations when, in fact, I am wrong, which does happen fairly often. Uh, the son had gotten to that place, and he, he went back home. So this story with the ring didn't end there. Uh, the ring was still lost, so I'm just going to set it aside for a moment. But Holly and I found ourselves uh, in the middle of campus. It's a place called The Grove. It's, uh, it's a bunch of big trees, and it was still nighttime. You know, we're out in the middle of the grass, not knowing what to do. And I was wrestling with it inside, maybe a little bit like the sun. I don't really want to go home because I don't know what my dad's going to say. I, I was thinking, I really don't know what to do in this relationship because uh, is the ring really that important to me? Or is this relationship more important? And those are the things that were going on in my head. And we got to the point in the middle of the grove where it just kind of struck me. Hey, this is just a ring. It's just, it's just a piece of metal with a little fake jewelry thing in there, right? And the person standing in front of me is vastly more important to me than this, this little ring. And so we had a little heart to heart in the grass that evening and uh, that was the, the first night that I really had the realization that I love this person. And I said that. And several awkward moments later, um, she reciprocated by saying that back to me, thankfully. <laughs> it was, uh, you know how those situations go, where you, you put yourself out there and you're just not sure what the reply is going to be. And I imagine that that's a little bit about what this son was dealing with. He was putting himself back out there. I want to be back in the family. I'm not sure what this is going to look like. I think maybe dad will just make me one of the servants. And he was blown away by the response that the father had. The extreme generosity of the prodigal father who took even more of his wealth, the fatted calf and the ring and the, the robe and the sandals and, and the party that ensued. And he had that to welcome his son back home, back in the family, back as a son. I want to suggest to you today that the story of the prodigal son really isn't as much about what was lost. The night that we were standing in the grove, that night wasn't really about this ring, but it was about what could be found. And it wasn't the ring, and it wasn't just finding the son, but what could be found was that relationship reestablished again. That they, they had come together, and that was, that's what the father was, was longing for. That was what the father was, was ready for. It wasn't about the time and the money that was wasted. All of the wild living and all of the history and the record 
if you had written, written it down, all the things that that son had done, the father doesn't even ask about that in this story. He just welcomes him home. He runs to him and embraces him and welcomes him back into the family. So, now we get to the older brother. And maybe you're thinking that we should just avoid this part because many of you might identify with the older brother more than with the younger one. Maybe you're struggling with uh, how do I relate to someone who I know God has blessed and has shown extreme favor to when it feels like I haven't got those same benefits. I didn't cash out on my relationship. I've been with Jesus for a long time. And what Jesus has to say to you, what, what God our Father has to say to you, is that what he has has always been yours. That's what he says at the end of this story. We're just going to skip down to verses 31 and 32. The father talking to the older son says, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. The prodigal son story was never about an inheritance. It was always about a relationship. May I suggest to you that maybe this season of our lives isn't really about COVID-19, but it's about our souls. It's about the deepening of our relationship with Jesus. It's about the deepening of our, our relationship with our families, with our neighbors, with those who are close to us. It's taking the time to step back, get back to the basics of what this walk with our Lord really should look like away from all the distractions that, that have taken us different directions. But it gives us the opportunity to, to reflect and to say, what is God teaching me now? What are the things that I need to change in my life now that I probably should have been doing all along? So as we wrap up today, I want to give you um, the rest of the story. Uh, if you've ever heard of Paul Harvey on the radio, uh, he's been dead for a while. But I always listened to him when I was on the farm in high school and college summers. I worked on a grass seed farm, and that was the lunchtime tradition, listening to Par Paul Harvey. And he always had this, this thing called the rest of the story. So you've heard the first part of the story about this ring and how it was lost. Well, we got to the point that evening in the grove where we said we loved each other and we were moving on. And Holly was going to class several weeks later and was walking along one of those paths that we had walked on a few weeks before. And believe it or not, she looks down on the, along the path and there's this shiny thing that catches her eye. And so she goes over to investigate and she found the ring <laughs> right next to the sidewalk that we had looked on and we had shined our flashlights that way and we hadn't found. God had brought it all back together and saved me from buying a new class ring, which I probably wasn't gonna do anyway. But uh, we have it today because of that. It reminds me of Jesus when he says in Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. God doesn't want you to lose out in life. He wants you to have all of the inheritance that he's planning for you. He wants you to have all of the resources and the blessing that he has for, for you and for your family, for those close to you. He wants you to be in relationship with him. And that's more important than any inheritance and any wealth could ever be. He wants that relationship to be restored. There is joy in that. Verse 24 says, and so the party began. We can really only imagine what that party looked like. And in this season, one of the things that I've been reflecting on, and maybe you've thought about this too, is the idea of celebrations and the idea of grieving and mourning loss. It looks differently now. Uh, whether it's a wedding that has been postponed or has shrunk uh, to a smaller number, 
Whether you're preparing for a graduation that's not going to look the same, or you've had someone uh, close to you pass away, and you haven't been able to celebrate their life or to remember them in the way that, that you had, you, that you've wanted to. I celebrated a birthday uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was actually kind of a lame day. It was just like any other Monday. Um, not that my family didn't try to celebrate, and they, we did like a Zoom birthday cake thing and uh, all of that, but it's just, it's just not the same. So you may be struggling with that, and, and when we talk about having joy and, and celebrating, maybe that's, maybe that's hard right now. Uh, so as, as we wrap up, I just want to pray for you and pray for us collectively that we would be able to enter into those moments of joy and celebration, especially when we see someone, uh, and maybe it's just ourselves, come back into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that as our Heavenly Father, you exhibit all of the aspects of this Father that Jesus shared about in this story. We thank you that you run to us with open arms. We thank you that you are always ready to welcome us home and that you don't welcome us back as servants or as subordinates, but you welcome us back with full family rights and membership, that you just want that relationship back with us and it really doesn't matter how much it costs you. We know that you sent your son Jesus and he laid down his life as a sacrifice for us to take away all of the sins and all of the mistakes and the things, the, the wild living that we have done. You've paid that and so that's no longer a question. The question is whether we're gonna turn and go back home. So God, would you help us uh, just as individuals to make that decision today again and again to, to understand our salvation, not just as a one-time issue, but as something we do daily in returning to you and focusing again on you. And I pray for those who are struggling right now to find joy and to find uh, meaningful celebration and, and thinking of the opposite of that, to find meaningful ways of grieving and mourning, if that's the case. God, I pray for your peace and I pray for your uh, your wisdom and your guidance and, and all of that. Uh, we, we just know that you're with us. We thank you for welcoming us back. Pray this all in your name. Amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never Praise us.
Love for those around me. Holy, 
no one like you There is none beside you You opened up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me That was that was awesome, and uh, man, I just love that that the Bible is such a living document. Because uh, I remember reading through this story many times before, uh, and every time I read it, it just hits somewhere different. And uh, what what great timing it is every single time. Uh, whenever you're going through something and you turn to the Word, even if it's a passage that you've read in the past. It's going to hit you somewhere different. So, God, I just thank you for that. And wow, uh, Matt, as you're sharing, uh, what, what really hit me today was uh, I, I really related to the older brother. And uh, as I was reading it for myself, which, which I challenged you to do that, uh, maybe after, after, the, after you watch it online, uh, to just go back and read it for yourself and ask God, what, what's God saying for you today through this, through this scripture? Uh, and then I just, I'll just share this uh, with you. That happened to me, and that was identifying with the older brother. Um, and not as the way that the story tells it, but, but rewinding it a little bit more to the, uh, the original or the, the beginning of that sibling relationship. Um, because as we read the passage where it says that the older brother says, you know, that son of yours has come home. Uh, it's very interesting to me. He doesn't call him by name. It's this son of yours. Uh, so where, at what point, did the enemy start driving a wedge between the two brothers and how easy it was for the older brother to also realize what he had lost? Because even though he stayed home, he also lost something. He saw he just lost uh, what he already had, which was the, that perfect relationship with his father, to be at home, to be doing the work that his dad wanted him to do. And so I challenge you to, to, as you go back and you read it, uh, who do you identify with? Do you identify with the younger brother that, that goes away and then comes back? Do, I, do you identify with the older brother that stayed home and worked his butt off so that he could impress his dad or to just have his, his dad be proud of him, even though his dad already was, but he just, he did everything. I could just picture him sweating and working as hard as he can to impress his dad, which he already was impressed because he was his son. Or do you identify with, with the father? Maybe you have, you have kids of your own that have taken either stance. Who do you relate with in this, sto in this story? Uh, so, Father, as we, as we close and, and we pray and we say thank you, we say thank you that, that you, you did not just only give us a book, but that you gave us your, your word and your word that is fresh and it's fresh new every day, Father, that we can read it time and time again. And it's so timely every time, Father. I just thank you so much for, for the perfect love that you cast over all of us. Father, that when you call me your favorite, that doesn't mean that others aren't. That just means that each one of us is your favorite, Father, and that you love us, each of us, the same. And the, the, as Matt shared, the, the extravagant love that you have for us, Father, it's not diminished because we think you love one or the other more. It's because we all have it, Father. And I just, I thank you for your word today. Father, I thank you that we can continue to hear from you and continue to gather even though it looks different. And Father, I just pray that you would release us into our neighborhoods. And so I'll say that uh, with that, that you are dismissed. So uh, stand up, hug somebody. If there's nobody around you, then uh, open your door because I'm sure there's people that are around you that you probably already know or should get to know. And uh, I encourage you to have a great week. So you're dismissed. <laughs>